A lot of nonsense has been written on many areas of economics. By far more nonsense has been written on the topic of money than any other area. Every guy with a pen and ink and a typewriter, or a, and or a typewriter feels obliged to come out with a tract on money. Most of it's pure junk. In most cases, the people who write on money, usually known as money cranks, in one way or the other come up with a conclusion that the, what's, what's needed to solve all the problems of the world is for the government or somebody else to issue unlimited amounts of money. And when this happens, all problems will be solved because everybody have money and be able to spend it. One of the problems is in order to refute the money crank with, real, with precision, you have to take a position finally which is really the opposite, the, uh, the polar opposite of money crankism, which most economists and other people don't go far enough to take. The definitions of money are usually also pretty weak. The worst example I know of is the Chamber of Commerce in the United States came out with a textbook on economics about 20 years ago in a series of pamphlets and, and chapters. When it came to the money chapter, and this is really, of course, an unusually bad definition, but I, I think it's really implicit in the analysis of most economists these days, they define money as, quote, money is whatever the government says it is, unquote. That was the, the whole definition of money. I said, it's a pretty bad example, but it still, I think, captures the spirit. In order to really understand what money is all about, first place, I should also say this current analysis, so-called macroeconomic area, is built up out of the microeconomic area. In most textbooks, when you deal with a micro field, you're talking about supply and demand, individual action, prices, that sort of stuff. And suddenly you're in the macro field, you're talking about something completely different. You're talking about all sorts of equations and banks and so forth, and there's no relationship between what's the sort of a fairly clear-cut supply and demand analysis on the one hand, and the sort of all the stuff going on out there in the macro field on the other. We're going to, we're going to tie it in. Uh, in order to really understand what money is all about, you can't start off with the current 1974. You have to start off with how money originates to capture the essence of what it's all about. We go back now, not exactly to Crusoe, but Crusoe 20 years later, with half a dozen people or so in a little village. They're engaging in specialization, division of labor, and all the things we've been talking about. And one guy's producing eggs, another guy's producing wheat, and a third guy's making shoes, and so forth and so on. Rudimentary specialization, division of labor. And each one exchanges the surplus of his product or the surplus of other people's products. And everybody benefits from the exchange, and so forth and so on. You can even talk in terms of demand curves and supply curves. Money hasn't popped up yet. In other words, so far, the guy, the egg producer, exchanges some of his eggs for somebody else's wheat. And the wheat producer does likewise the other direction, and the, the, the egg producer exchanges some of his eggs for somebody for a pair of shoes. And so what you have then is what's known as barter, or direct exchange, in which everything exchanged between two people directly benefits each person. You get the eggs and you eat them, or you, you get the shoes and you wear them, and so forth. So every term in the equation, so to speak, is a directly useful product. So, so far, money hasn't originated. Uh, in barter, there are certain difficulties which pop up very quickly in the game. As soon as you get beyond Crusoe on Friday and get a few people in the village, you run into some problems in trying to work out a system of barter. Well, to apply it to a modern context, I'm going out trying to buy a newspaper. There's no money. So in order for me to, to buy a newspaper, I have to find a news dealer who wants, let's say, five minutes of quick economic instruction. And we bought this thing, we have a little, uh, little go-around here, 30 seconds of uh, <laughs> economics, and I'm off of a paper. Now, obviously, it's going to be very, very difficult. I'm going to starve to death pretty quickly. I have to find a grocer who wants some economic instruction, and so forth and so on. Even in, even in the primitive village, supposing the shoemaker is allergic to eggs. He doesn't want any eggs. What's the egg dealer going to do if he wants a pair of shoes, or if he wants his shoes repaired? He's in trouble right away. So you start off in trouble from the very beginning, and you're not going to get too far. Obviously, you can't build up any kind of modern economic system that way, because for one thing, supposing you're a steel manufacturer, what are you going to do with your steel bars? You have to go around and find, if you want to exchange it for food, you have to get a steel bar and try to find a grocer like a steel bar. It's not too easy to contemplate kind of either. Uh, you have the problem, what, was, what used to be known in the textbooks, as a double coincidence of wants. In other words, you have a problem of trying to find somebody who wants what you want and also has what you want to have. It's not that easy. Another problem with this is, is the problem of indivisibilities. In other words, I've got a tractor, let's say. I want to sell the tractor. And I want to sell it and exchange it for other things. I have 20 different things, let's say. So I, I have to find a grocer who wants a whole tractor. I can't chop up the tractor into 20 parts. <laughs> so once you start chopping up the tractor, it loses its value. So you have the problem of indivisibilities. You can, nobody wants a tractor. And you can't chop up a tractor in five parts. You have problems with any large thing and trying to divide it into parts and use that for barter. There's also another problem, which would be very severe in the uh, world of barter. There's no way to really calculate, if you're a business firm, there's no way to calculate what your income is and what your expenditures are. There's no way to calculate whether you're engaging in a profitable business, 
whether you're running a loss or a profit, because you have to say, let's see, I took in during the month so the following things, 20 kegs of nails, 30 dozen eggs. You know, you list about 50 different things, and, you, and, you sold, uh, and you're paying out 20 kegs of this and five feet of lumber, and there's no, way to, there's no common denominator about which you can measure these things or estimate them. You don't know what the heck's going on. No accounting system can work under barter. There's no one price for any. If, you, if, if the former wants to know what the price of eggs is, you have to tell them, well, let's see, the price of eggs is as follows. One loaf of bread, two pounds of butter, one-tenth of a hat, and so forth and so on. It goes down a whole list of hundreds of thousands of different things. And so you never know what any price is. It's a complete state of confusion. So no real market of any size or any complexity can develop under barter. Okay, so you have this world of barter. It's a world of struggling to, to develop, but obviously getting nowhere fast. Let's go back to the egg dealer. And there's three guys in the village. There's a wheat farmer, an egg dealer, and a shoemaker. And the shoemaker happens to be allergic to eggs. The egg dealer and the shoes are falling apart. The, the egg man gets a brilliant idea. He goes to the wheat farmer and finds out the wheat farmer is not allergic to eggs. He exchanges his eggs for the wheat. And he takes the wheat. And he doesn't want the wheat. See, this is the first time in the history of the world, so to speak, in this model, where the guy buys wheat not because he wants wheat. He might be allergic to bread. He's buying the wheat not because he wants it for himself or to eat it or whatever, but in order to exchange it for the shoes because he knows that the shoe shoemaker will buy wheat. So we have for the first time then an indirect exchange or an exchange with a medium. In other words, buying something, not because you want it as you do under a barter, but because you know somebody else will want it. And by doing this, you're able now to expand your scope. You don't have to look for a non-allergic shoemaker. You can now find a shoemaker who wants bread, which is easier to, say, easier to find. So you begin to arrive at a situation where valuable commodities begin to be purchased, not just for, for their own direct use, but because somebody else wants them. In other words, they're particularly marketable. And you know that somebody else wants them, and you buy them in order to resell them to somebody, to a third person. Commodity functions as what's known as a medium of exchange. And this is a case of indirect exchange as opposed to direct exchange. Because what happens is a certain product, in this case wheat, is now being demanded not just for itself, but also as a medium. See, this raises the demand curve for the product. Once something begins to be used in any society as a medium of exchange, it begins to snowball, because when, you, when somebody finds out, hey, they're using wheat as a medium of exchange in northwestern Brooklyn, then anybody who's dealing with northwestern Brooklyn will buy wheat and, no, and will have sort of confidence in, the, in this fact that he can get rid of the wheat, because people in northwestern Brooklyn are using it as a medium. This encourages people who have dealings with northwestern Brooklyn to start buying wheat themselves, and it has a snowballing effect. The more people use it, the more people find out about other people using it, and this very shortly, one or two commodities begin to spiral upward and begin to be used as a medium for all exchanges, or virtually all exchanges in the society. When you get to that point, and you get to one commodity or two commodities which are being used as a medium for all exchanges, this is called a general medium of exchange, and this is the definition of money. Money is a commodity which is used, or a thing which is being used as a general medium for exchanges. And once you have a situation where you have a general medium of exchange, when money has been established on the market, not because the government has come in and said, I, I think we'll make cowrie shells money, or I think we'll make wheat money, or something like that. Money emerges on the market, and always has emerged on the market, as in this sort of process. As a, the fact that people on the market see that certain commodities are more marketable than others, they start using it as media, they find this expands their horizons enormously. Pretty soon you wind up with this in the market process with one or two commodities as a, a general medium of exchange. Once a commodity has been established as money, all sorts of goodies flow from it. Enormous economic benefits flow from this fact. Say gold is established as money. Now you don't have to worry, if you're an economics professor, you don't have to worry about, let's see, what, what does that grocer want in exchange? You don't have to worry about that. Everybody wants money, and so all you have to do is to sell whatever you have, services for money. Instead of having a double coincidence of wants, all you, have, all you need is one guy wanting one thing. All you need is somebody wanting eggs or somebody wanting economics education or whatever. And money then becomes the other term for every exchange. So second of all, the result of this is that indivisibility is now wiped out. Indivisibility is no longer a problem. Since money is, is divisible itself, if you want to get rid of your tractor and exchange it for, for a couple of cows and so forth and so on, a whole bunch of other things, you can sell the tractor for the money commodity, take the money and divide it up into different small parts, exchange these parts for hi-fi sets, Wheaties, and whatever. Since money is divisible and everybody wants it, everybody will take it in exchange. There's no problem then with trying to figure out what the other guy wants, want, and worrying about the indivisible product. All these problems are solved. The third problem is the problem of economic calculation. Economic calculation is not only simplified, it's made possible by the existence of money. But the business firm or the person 
can say, what's my income for last month? My income is X amount of dollars or X amount of gold grams. Paid out so and so many gold grams, therefore my profit is such and such, or my losses are such and such. Since all calculations now take place in the money commodity, there's enormous simplification for the whole thing. The whole process of accounting, the whole process of figuring out whether you're making profits or suffering losses now becomes possible. As a result, money is an incomparable benefit to society. It's the most important single invention rather than fire and all the rest of it. It came about, of course, not because one single person invented it, but because natural, unquote, quote, unquote, market processes. No one person sat down and said, hey, I think we'll, we'll have something called money and, and establish it. Also, what happens is, that this goes along with the ease of economic calculation. If you want to know what the price of eggs is, instead of having to say, let's see, the price of eggs is one loaf of bread or half a pound of butter, etc., etc., and go down the list, there's only one price for everything, that's the money price. Whatever the, price, the ruling price is in money, so the price of loaf of bread is whatever, 75 cents, and that's it. Okay, so we see these enormous advantages and benefits from money. Then the question arises... What good will it be established in the market as money? What will usually emerge on the market as money? Well, usually it's the best moneyable product, best money-ish. What is that term? Good. A whole bunch of different types of commodities have been used as monies uh, in the past. Salt, tobacco, uh, cattle. The southern colonies in America in the 17th centuries and 18th centuries, uh, tobacco was used as money. Tobacco was a major product. And business accounts were kept in terms of hogsheads of tobacco. A great, one of probably the most single anthologized article in economics is a very excellent article by an English economist who happened to be in a German prisoner of war camp in World War II. And he, after the war, he wrote an article called the Economics of a Prisoner of War Camp. And he shows what happened there. Of course, it's a large community. The only supplies coming in were essentially care packages and things like that. What happens is that money begins to emerge. A money begins to emerge. Obviously, there's no cash in that sort of system. And the money that emerged in the POW camps were cigarettes. And you began to have a situation where everything was priced in terms of cigarettes, a market developed. A British officer would post on the board periodically what the price of, you know, can of anchovies, three packs, can of so-and-so, one pack, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everything would have its price. A whole price system developed. It's a beautiful example of a market in action. Or some enterprising speculators would do, they buy up something at the, when the, you know, the care package, let's say, would come the first of the month. So during the first week, prices would tend to be lower than the last week because supplies are being eaten up by the end of the month. So enterprising speculators would buy the stuff when it's cheap, say the canned anchovies or whatever, hold it off the market until the last week and then sell it, thus taking advantage of the higher price, and thereby smoothing out the price fluctuations and shifting the supply of the commodities, allocating it to where the consumers are most needed. It was the last week. So all these things began to emerge. And sure enough, another thing that emerged is also inflation, because sometimes more cigarettes would start pouring in and the prices would go up. And then, sure enough, wouldn't, wouldn't you know, they decided finally, or the British officers decided to impose price control, because it was inflation. <laughs> the POW camps, they imposed price control, and they immediately the shortages developed. Where's the cigarettes? Can't find any, uh, can't find any other commodities. And there was a black market developed with hot anchovies and all that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, finally, uh, and finally, they just threw up their hands, and they said, the heck whether the price controls won't work, and they eliminated it. Of course, the shortages, shortages, shortages immediately disappeared. <laughs> it's a beautiful microcosmic example of the current situation, past, present, and future, for that matter. Anyway, cigarettes were the best money around. They, were, they had, of course, in, in the absolute sense, some disadvantages. First place, they crumpled easily. You, know, you sort of make the wrong move and the whole the cigarettes, your money goes, goes down the chute. <laughs> so the cigarettes got stale, and stale cigarettes were discounted, uh, discounted fresh cigarettes. They weren't very durable and so forth. And also, they, they were, existed in abundant quantities. So as more cigarettes poured in by well-meaning friends of the, of the relatives of the prisoners, which then this would cause inflation rate. But it was the best money they had. Over the centuries... If enough stuff is available, so you don't have to make do with cigarettes or hogsheads of tobacco, two metals have emerged on the market over thousands of years, time-tested, have emerged on the market as the best monies, with all the great moneyish qualities needed, namely gold and silver. Gold, for particularly since gold is scarcer than silver, gold is usually used for larger transactions and silver for smaller transactions. The two can really continue side by side. Now here, the old money and banking textbooks used to have a great chapter dealing with the question, which is the commodities make the best money? Which are the money-ish qualities? Of course, that's what we'll drop that now because there's no commodity money anymore. And the money which does exist has obviously so bad in relation to any money-ish qualities, it's best not to talk about it. <laughs> uh, in other words, paper and, and government fiat bank accounts are about the last thing that the market would choose as money. Well, what are the great money-ish qualities? Well, first place, it should be very marketable. It should be something in great demand, which before it even begins as money. 
And these things which are picked on in each society is usually in great demand. The cowrie shell is a great demand. Gold and silver has always been a great demand. It's ornament. It's all off of a sort of a firm base in its original non-money form. Also, it should be divisible. It should be a commodity which you can chop up into small pieces and not lose the whole value. Gold and silver have two remarkable qualities as metals that you can take them, you can slice them into very small pieces and it doesn't lose a couple apart, doesn't lose their value. They're highly divisible. Also, it should be a high value per unit quantity. Cigarettes is unfortunately a low value per unit quantity. Each cigarette doesn't, doesn't worth much. So what you need is something that has a high value per unit quantity, which will therefore also be portable easily, so you don't have to lug it around. You have to lug cattle around. Cattle have been used as money in, in African tribes. For an urban society, it's sort of a pain in the neck to, to drive cattle around if you want to buy something. <laughs> so it should have a high value per unit quantity. It should be also durable. It should be able to sock it away in a, under a mattress or something and pull it out 50 years later. So it should be very durable, which gold and silver are. Gold and silver also are divisible and have a high value per unit quantity. Also, it should be something that's easily recognizable and difficult to counterfeit. Gold is also that way. The average person can easily tell, at least used to tell in the old gold days, be able to tell quite quickly whether it's really gold or not. You bite it and you, you ring it on the table, etc. Drop it quickly. So, for all these reasons, gold and silver emerge from very early in the game as the best monies. Also, as we'll see later, one of the great qualities of gold and silver is the best money. Is it's not, it has to be dug out of the ground. It's not subject to government turning on the printing presses. The market chooses gold and silver for these reasons. Free market economists tend to choose it for those, plus the fact that you can get them outside of government. You can be supplied outside of government by that as an extra reason. And those are really the reasons why gold standard types are favor of the gold standard, and not because they love to sit there and run their hands through gold coin. Not only is this the model of the way money has originated as a free market money, Ludwig von Mises showed 60 years ago now that this is the only way that money can originate. Money cannot originate either by a social contract, everybody getting around in one big assembly and saying, hey, I think we need some money, and somebody saying, okay, let's use uh, dingbats or whatever. <laughs> cannot originate by government fiat where the king says, we will now make the shell, we're going to make that money. Can't work that way. This has been shown by Mises' so-called regression theorem, which solves a lot of very important theoretical problems that the uh, Austrian school and the marginal utility school faced uh, at the turn of the century. Basically, the problem was this. You can see why the demand for, every, for anything, demand for eggs, demand for hula hoops or whatever, would be determined by the marginal utility that the consumers have for these things and their value scales. The marginal utility of hula hoops determines the demand for hula hoops, etc. The point about money is the peculiar thing about money, you're using money in exchange, you're buying money, so to speak. You're selling your goods and services for money, not because you want to use it directly, but because you want to exchange it for something else. So therefore, the demand for money itself, the very fact that you're, you're demanding money in your value scale, in other words, you have a margin utility for money, which has not been applied to monetary theory since either before Mises or since. The reason why you have a margin utility for money is, because, is precisely because you have pre-existing prices in terms of money. Money has a pre-existing purchasing power. They have the problem, like supposedly circular reasoning here. In other words, the problem for explaining the price of money, demand for money in terms of its margin utility, is that you can see you can have a margin utility for eggs because you like to eat it, but you're not presuming a previous price. But when it comes to money, the very fact that you have a margin utility for it presumes or assumes a preceding price for it, preceding price level, in quotes. So how do you get out of this, uh, what used to be called the Austrian circle? Well, Mises is the one who solved this by saying as follows. Yes, it's true, there's a time element and the demand for money, which doesn't exist in the demand for other things. Say the margin utility of money in day X is in some way a function of or dependent on the price level or the purchasing power of, the, of money in the day X minus one, previous day. However, he said, if you push this back, you keep pushing this back logically in time, you'll finally arrive at the first day, the day when gold is first used as money, uh, in a logical sense. Previously, they had been only in barter. And you go back beyond that, the last day when gold was only used as barter, then you have a situation where gold is demanded only for its own sake, only for its ornament, whatever. And the margin utility of gold at that point will have no time component at all. So the demand for gold on the day before it's used as money is purely the consequence of the margin utility of gold on that day. And afterwards, when you start using it as a medium of exchange, then there's this time component in it. Then you say, well, it's dependent on the fact that you have a previous price for it. Which means that no money can ever originate unless it originally was. Uh, non-monetary non -monetary use. In other words, you have to have a starting point where it was used, where it was valuable and had a price on the market which was a non-monetary price. Ergo, all monies have to emerge as originally a useful commodity, a non-monetary commodity, <coughs> like gold or silver. For the, you, know, you can kick gold and silver out, the thing can still function as money afterward. Keep on indefinitely on momentum. 
But if, as far as originating money, you have to begin with a non-monetary useful commodity. Okay, we have gold and silver established. We say it has to be established on the market. What's the currency unit? What, what unit do you keep the account in? You're talking about income and expenditure. Well, metals are always exchanged in terms of weight, units of weight. You're talking about tons of iron or uh, pounds of copper or whatever. Therefore, the monetary unit will be a unit of weight of gold or silver. Let's say if you take gold as the money, uh, in that case the gold gram or the gold ounce will be the monetary unit. Then economic calculations, income expenditure, all, uh, prices, all these will, will take place in terms of the gold gram or the gold ounce. The unit of weight of gold becomes the currency unit. Once again, there's no example in history where any monetary unit has emerged except as originally a unit of weight of gold or silver or some other commodity. The dollar, for example, began as a, I think, 16th century Bavaria, somewhere around that area. It was a count of Joachim's Tal. During those days, the noblemen often issued their own uh, coins. And the count of Joachim's Tal issued a coin, which was, had a, uh, the name was the count of Schlick. Count Schlick of Joachim's Tal. And he, and he issued these coins, which had great, which circulated all through Europe because they were pretty and they, had, they, they lasted a long time. They looked good. And they were called uh, Joachim's Talers or Schlichten Talers. Uh, I think an ounce weight of silver. became a famous coin, a Schlichten, you know, Joachim's Talers. And pretty soon, as people do, they abbreviate, and they lopped off the Schlichten and the Joachim. It was just called Talers. It becomes transmogrified into dollars later on. And the pound sterling, the British currency unit, of course, originally meant that. It meant a pound of silver. Well, that's what it was. A pound sterling was a pound of silver. It's now, of course, a heck of a lot less than a pound of silver. <laughs> <laughs> so currency unit was originally a, a weight of gold and silver. One of the first pieces of evil which was injected into the monetary system was beginning to use names instead of weights, sort of a special name. Once that happened, that was the beginning of the end. The first step on the slippery slope down on the current to accelerated runaway inflation was the, was the first time the, the king, instead of talking about gold ounce, why don't you talk about the, if the king's name is Edward, why don't you talk about the Edward? It's classier than talking about the gold ounce. Right? You define the Edward as being one gold ounce, you have an Edward coin instead of a gold ounce coin, then you begin the slippage into perdition. <laughs> During the late 19th century, when most nations were on the gold standard, there were several international monetary conferences. These are not like the current international monetary conference where people sit around trying to figure out how to inflate more and how to shaft the public. Those are real international monetary conferences. The idea was, why can't we take all these names that have popped up, all of which were defined in terms of units of weight of gold, and why don't we put them on one scale first? Most of them were sort of multiples of each other. The pound sterling was almost $5. It was a little bit less. Why don't we make it $5? change it a little bit, and then we can proceed on. The next step after making each one a multiple of the other, to abolish the dollar and pound altogether, just make them weights of gold. And we'll have one world gold unit. And that was the uh, objective of most of these guys in the late 19th century. They were all laissez-faire liberals, and they were all hard money types. And they founded on the whole silver question, very esoteric. But the point is the relationship between gold and silver and whether it should be fixed or not, founded on that, on these questions. By the time they, that got straightened out, the world was off the gold standard altogether. It was, it was the end of that. So the first step was naming the thing a name instead of a, instead of a weight. The dollar later became, when the United States was founded, the dollar was defined as one, approximately one twentieth of a gold ounce. It was also fixed in terms of silver, which is unfortunate. It's now approximately one forty-second of a gold ounce. But even now, it's the official definition of a dollar is one forty-second of a gold ounce. That's what a dollar is. A dollar is not just a dollar, not just a piece of paper printed by the government. It's supposed to be, at least officially, it's supposed to be 142nd of a gold ounce. How did this change? Very early in the game, the government, the kings and so forth, established themselves as the guardian of the nation's weights and measures. Of course, the big thing, you have to have a government to make sure that a yard is always a yard. And you have the metric yard or whatever it is somewhere, it's some under glass. And that's the yard. All other things are supposed to be replicas, pale reflections of, this, of the pure form of the yard. And you have the pound sitting there somewhere. I mean, and the government is supposed to be the august guardian of this. And you always make sure that you never, never change and juggle these standards. Otherwise, the whole economic system would be irrevocably messed up. As part of this guardianship of weights and measures is also guarding the weight, gold, and silver. First, the first place is to nobody's real interest, really, to juggle the yards and feet. The government issued a decree saying, okay, from now on, a yard is no longer three feet, it's two and a half feet. A foot is no longer 12 inches, it's now 11. It's obviously pretty absurd, you have to be pretty kooky, even for the government, to do something like that. So nobody's real advantage to do this. So you have the fixed foot and the fixed yard, and it's there forevermore, and the meter, and so forth. But, in the case of money, you don't have this question. In the case of money, you have the economic vested interest of a compulsory monopoly guardian of the purity of the money to start juggling the definition. First, the government started by establishing a compulsory monopoly of the mint. Mint function. Usually, gold, for example, exchanged by weight. You have a pound of gold, an ounce of gold, etc. 
But then after a while, we discover that certain forms, certain shapes of gold are inconvenient. For example, gold dust. Now, it used to be back in the old California gold strike days, people walked around with gold dust. You remember the, the Western movies? The old prospector comes in with a bag of gold dust and plumps it down and exchanges it for the general store, and they weigh it. And you can do that, but it's kind of inconvenient. First of all, the gold dust begins to evaporate. You know, you walk around in a cloud of gold dust, and your money is disappearing very rapidly. So you want to have a sort of a hard form. Over the centuries, the two most convenient forms are bullion or bars and coins, the coins for smaller transactions. And when you transform a bullion into a coin, there's a certain amount of cost involved in it. Usually the coin will then be at a premium in relation to the bullion. And the king saw a good thing here. But the, the kings very early uh, established the, the, the view that a compulsory monopoly of the mint was essential to the sovereignty of the king. That if you don't do this, and the king of the state is no longer sovereign, and somehow the state is weakened irrevocably by this by giving up the mint monopoly. By this philosophy of sovereignty, they established the view that only the government should be able to mint coins. By doing this, of course, they're not only giving a profitable business in the hands of the government, see more than that, it means you can keep out anybody else from getting in there, and therefore you can proceed on debasing the coins and juggling the standards, and nobody can do anything about it. Debasement comes in very early, the first form of inflation, the early forms of inflation, before these marvelous inventions of paper money and bank credit, pre-1700, let's say, <laughs> of inflation or debasement of the coin. Usually it works something like this. A new king is crowned, and he looks around and he says, hey, there's a lot of coins here with your, my father's picture on it. We really need your coins with my picture on it. Besides, the old coins are getting dirty and they're getting kind of shabby. They're getting a little worn. Why don't you all come down to the royal mint and we'll, for a nominal fee, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll exchange it for you. We'll give you nice new shiny coins. So everybody troops in and usually make a compulsory to hasten the process. So you have a... Um, the Edward, let's say the Edward is defined as a unit of weight of two ounces of gold. Come in with your two ounce coin, you get the two Edwards back, have your two Edwards. Okay, that's terrific, you're not really losing anything at all, except there's one slight hitch here. Instead of the Edward being the two ounces apiece, the Edward is now an ounce and a half, it's been redefined. In other words, the unit of weight has been lowered. You're getting a much lighter weight coin back. If you have a two ounce coin, you redefine the Edward as one and a half ounce, what happens to the other half ounce? Well, obviously you know what happens to the other half ounce, the king keeps it takes all these half ounces of gold and mints his own coins and spends it. Spends it on, he spends it. Now, the public is in great shape. They've got the same number of Edwards back. The king is in even better shape. He, he has Edwards that he didn't have before at all. As we'll see, what happens as a result of all this is you have inflation. Uh, more Edwards are on the market in relation to whatever goods and services are available. The price of everything else goes up. So that was the earliest, the classic form of inflation, before paper money was invented, before bank credit was invented, it was coin clipping or debasement. Obviously, when private people clip coins, it's very bad. The maximum punishment of the law is to upon their head, because that means you're, you're taking the guy's coin, you're taking the guy's two ounces, you're shaving off a tenth of an ounce or something, and then you're, you collect the shavings together and you make your own coin. It's obviously immoral and evil, but when the government does it, it's part of an essential part of attribute of sovereignty and therefore good. Uh, getting back from coin clipping. We'll go back to coin clipping, of course. We, have, we now have the gold ounce, let's say, established as the currency unit. And all coins are in terms of gold ounces or gold grams. This means that every coin is, or every currency unit is automatically fixed in relation to every other one. We have a big controversy now among economists about fixed exchange rates versus fluctuating exchange rates. The point is there's no such thing as fluctuating exchange rate because there ain't no exchange rate. Now, let me put it this way. If you're exchanging a pound of something for a certain number of ounces of the same thing. You'll naturally exchange one pound of it for 16 ounces of it, because that's what a pound is, a pound of 16 ounces. Then if you have one coin, let's say if Boston is putting out Adams coins, which are weigh two ounces, and in Texas they're putting out Houston's, which weigh one ounce, then two Houston's will always exchange for one Adams because it's two to one, that's what the ounces are. So the, the so-called exchange rate is simply fixed by the weight of a coin. There's no need for anybody to fix it. It will automatically be this two for one. Those economists who claim that a fixed exchange rate is somehow coercive or somehow statist misconceive the whole point. The whole point is that it's not coercive to have the, you know, the fact that the two things are always going to exchange for 16 pounds, ounces for one pound. If, for example, there are two monies in the world, if some countries are on gold and some countries are on silver and some are a mixture of both, which can easily happen, then gold and silver will be the fluctuating exchange rates. In other words, the value of gold in relation to silver will keep fluctuating. In relation to supply and demand, we'll get to that some other time. But the only real fluctuating, in a, in a truly free market situation, there's only one fluctuating exchange rate, and that's between gold and silver. Everything else, within gold or within silver, the exchange rates are automatically fixed by the respective weight of the currency units. Now, of course, if each person in the world put out his own money, for example, obviously it's not going to be money. 
I issue five Rothbards, period. I, just, I issue a ticket saying five Rothbards. And everybody here has issues also their own tickets, their own name on it. There will be fluctuating exchange rates, I guess, between each one of them. Five Rothbards might exchange for one of somebody else's around here. But, of course, the point is nobody's going to take any of this stuff from you. It's all going to be scrap paper very quickly. <laughs> it was not an inherently useful commodity to begin with. Now, there are some anarchists, the Spooner Tucker variety, who believe that if, once there are no government restrictions on the money supply, everybody will be able to print their own money and, every, and be nirvana, because the money supply will no longer be artificially restricted by the government. And of course, I, if everybody were allowed to print their own money, everybody could print their own, you know, I could print my two, two million Rothbards immediately, and that's it. I mean, it'd be a waste of paper, nobody would take it, and that'd be the end of the personal paper money. Gold and silver very quickly emerge as the monies in that kind of society, and there'd be no panacea. Although it would be a lot better than it is now, I mean, the economic system. This is what has been called, uh, by the way, parallel standards. When you have a situation where you have gold and silver both functioning as independent monies without a fixed rate, without a government fixed rate between them. And it has happened all during the Middle Ages and late in the early modern period. Gold and silver would fluctuate. And so, for example, in, in the Italian city states, in Florence and Venice, etc., they'd just be every day, it'd be just be different fluctuations. The merchants would have a table, a weekly book or something, to show what the gold silver rate is that week. There'd be a free market and gold silver relationship. Okay, so you have this, this gold, uh, or let's say, is established on the market as the money. What's the relationship between that and prices? Well, first we get to the concept of purchasing power. Ever since Keynes wrote the general theory in 1936, the concept of purchasing power has been completely just distorted. In the Keynesian system, purchasing power means a total number of dollars, let's say. If there are $2 million out, that's the purchasing power. If there are $20 billion out, that's the purchasing power. This is not the original concept. Purchasing power, uh, let's, let's go back, for example, to the price of eggs. Under Boyer, what's the purchasing power of a dozen eggs? Well, it's the same thing as the price of a dozen eggs. The same thing. The price is the purchasing power of the thing. In other words, the price of something is whatever the thing can buy in exchange. If the price of an egg is, let's say, the price of a dozen eggs is a dollar, this means that, that means that a dozen eggs can command an exchange in exchange for one dollar. That's the purchasing power of a dozen eggs. Under Boyer, every commodity has a whole array of different purchasing powers. Or we can say this purchasing power is a whole array of possible alternatives. Under Boyer, let's say, a dozen eggs could exchange for the, for the following. Uh, either a pound of butter, or one-tenth of a hat, or two boxes of Wheaties, or etc., etc., all the way down the list, hundreds and hundreds of different items. All this array of either-ors would be the purchasing power of the of a dozen eggs. When money is established, you eliminate all this stuff, and you just have one price with a money price. So under money system, the purchasing power of a dozen eggs is its price, its money price, let's say a dollar. That's the price of money. Well, the price of money, or the purchasing power of money, which is the same thing here, is an array of all the different goods that can be bought from money. When money has been established, let's say if gold has been established as money, all the other things have a money price, one single price. In other words, high fi set, for one price, eggs has got one price, so forth and so on, except money itself, except gold itself. Gold is still in a state of barter in relationship to everything else. So when we talk in terms of the price of gold, the price of an ounce of gold will be same, a similar array as we've seen in barter. In other words, the price of an ounce of gold is either 10 pounds of butter or one-tenth of a high fi set or etc. etc. You go through this whole array of alternatives. That is the purchasing power of a, an ounce of gold or a currency unit of gold. So in other words, the purchasing power of the dollar, or the purchasing power of an ounce of gold, is the same thing as the price of gold, which in turn is the same thing as all the alternatives that, that this particular weight of gold can exchange for on the market. Often this is called the price level. The, the concept of price level can be, can be used sometimes as a sort of a shorthand, but it's, very, it's really a fallacious concept because it sort of implies that there's one level, one thing, which can be easily expressed as kind of average. But it's not really an average, it's, it's an array of specific different prices and different commodities, rather, which this dollar or this gold ounce can change for. And the relationship between these, these commodities do change over time. It's not just like one sort of one average price level which you can then juggle. Okay, so the purchasing power of the dollar will be this array, which is the same thing as the price of the dollar. We haven't come yet what forces, economic forces, determine the purchasing power of, of money or the purchasing power of the dollar at any time. First of all, all prices on the market tend to be uniform, tend to be uniform. In other words, if the price of Wheaties is 50 cents in one store and 60 cents in another store, unless other forces come in, in other words, unless one store has 
can charge more because their services are better, they, they allow credit or they, so they deliver at night or something like that. Barring all that, the prices of each product will tend to be the same because the price of Wheaties is 50 cents in one store and 60 cents next door. Very few people will buy the 60 cents at Wheaties. The price might go up in the 50 cent store and down in the 60 cent store. You might have, a, say, a resolution of the thing at 52 cents or something like that. In other words, it will reach equilibrium with a uniform price for any given good or service. The same thing will be true with the purchasing power of the dollar, or the purchasing power of gold, or the gold ounce. The purchasing power of the gold ounce will tend to be the same throughout its trading area. If the world is its trading area, then the purchasing power of the gold ounce will tend to be the same throughout the world. It will be a tendency toward a uniform, what's usually called price levels. Even more so than in the case of specific products, because specific products are usually produced at one place and then transported somewhere and then consumed the other place. For example, the price of wheat in Kansas will not be the same as the price of wheat in New York because you have to cover the, you know, you have to transport the wheat from Kansas to New York. The price of wheat in New York will tend to equal the price of wheat in Kansas plus the transportation cost to carry the wheat from Kansas to New York. In the case of money, however, the transportation cost really doesn't enter into the picture because once the gold is produced and circulating throughout the world, it, it, since it's durable, it sort of zips around, so to speak, and there's no longer the problem of transportation costs is not really in question. So the price levels then will tend to be the same, or the purchasing power of the gold ounce will tend to be the same throughout the world, throughout the trading area. Why? Because, well, it's fairly simple. If, for example, the purchasing power of gold, let's say, is higher in France than it is in England, then gold will tend to be shipped from England to France, which will tend to lower purchasing powers in, in the two countries. In terms of price levels, if the price level in terms of gold is higher in uh, France than it is in England, then people start, start spending money in England, They'll take their gold and going to England for it, buy stuff in England and not in France. This will tend to lower French prices, raise English prices, until the, the price levels or the arrays of prices are, are equilibrated. So the purchasing power of the gold tends to flow, like everything else where you can make most money at it or most income at it, gold will tend to flow from those areas where it has the lowest purchasing power to the areas where it has the highest purchasing power, and this will tend to equilibrate what determines the purchasing power of gold? It's essentially the supply of money and demand for money. In other words, we're going to apply the same analysis, really, to uh, the price of money, or the price of the gold ounce, as we do to the price of anything else. And here, this is the difference between the ordinary macroeconomics, where suddenly you're thrown into a peculiar world, we're talking about velocities and all that stuff, and supply and demand drops out of the picture altogether. Supply and demand really is still in the picture. First, let's talk about the supply of money. Before we even get to the very complex stuff about it, such as banking and things like that, which we'll get to later on, what is the supply of money exactly? Let's assume that money is just gold coins and gold bullion. First place, the supply curve of money, if we put the supply curve on the board, it's best to think of not as this forward sloping one, but as the vertical one. Stock of money at any given moment or any given time. First place, money is very durable. Gold is very durable. The annual production of gold is small in relation to the stock which has been accumulated for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's no real division of labor in gold as there is in everything else. You don't have somebody producing the, uh, the raw material and somebody else producing the steel and somebody producing the car, etc. You have everybody owning money and then shifting it around. So it's best to think of supply of money as a vertical line. A demand for money is a demand to hold it. Demand to buy it and hold it. The first thing to look at about the supply of money is that everybody at any given time owns, owns some money. In other words, there's no, such, there's no supply of money which isn't owned by somebody. There's no money floating around the empire in somewhere. All money is in somebody's cash balance. This, this brings us to the concept of cash balance. A cash balance is the amount of money, the stock of money that any given person has at any given moment. You can have some money in your wallet, and you have some on your mattress, and some on the safe deposit box, some on the floorboards. In the individual supply of money. Each individual then has his own stock of money, which we can call small m, depict by small m. The total supply of money in the society will be the aggregate of all the individual stocks of money, individual supplies, which would be big M. Big M is the usual symbol for the quantity of money or supply of money. It will simply be the sum of the, all the small m's. This ties in immediately to the macro money analysis. We talk about supply of money as simply the sum of all the little micro monies that everybody's got, all the little cash balances that each individual has. Now, when you get to money again, instead of talking about supply and demand, 
you usually read about circulation or the velocity of circulation. The concept of the velocity of circulation is sort of think of some ball that's zipping around a roulette table or something on the roulette wheel or something like that, as if it's a thing that's circulating by itself, as if it's some sort of mechanical thing out there, which is somehow engaged in circulation. It's not the way it is. Money is always sitting somewhere. In other words, it's always in somebody's cash balance. What happens during exchange, any exchange that takes place, using money as one of the terms of the exchange, is simply that you're transferring part of your cash balance to somebody else's cash balance and getting something else in exchange for it. So the money is circulated, or rather cash balances are transferred from one person to another. But aside from that little, that individual point of transfer, the money is resting in somebody's cash balance. So for example, if I buy a newspaper for 15 cents, my ownership of the cash at 15 cents, my cash balance at that point is drawn down by 15 cents, and the news dealer's cash balance is increased by 15 cents, and we have at that moment of transfer, we've shifted ownership of a certain part of my cash balance. We have this whole cash balance approach then, and we're dealing with the money supply and with the determination of the, of the so-called price level of the purchasing power. And then we have uh, demand for cash balances. Why should anybody demand a cash bill? Now, first of all, well, he has to get money in order to buy it, in order to use it for something else, in order to spend it. So the usual process is you produce a good or a service, you sell it, you get money, you get a cash balance, you hold on to it for a short while or a long while or whatever, you spend some of it on other goods. The demand for a cash balance is how much you want to keep, how much you want to sacrifice for it in the sense of how much you want to uh, sell in terms of goods and services for cash balance, how much you want to hold on to it. You have the same kind of demand and supply curve, except now in vertical terms, that we had when we talked about the supply curve at any given moment it was vertical. You have the price on the y-axis, you have the quantity purchased or held on the x-axis, supply of money will be a vertical line, which we call M, then we have the demand for money, which I maintain is going to be falling. What's the price of money on the y-axis? The price of money on the y-axis is the same thing as its, as its purchasing power of the money unit purchasing power of the gold ounce, or whatever you want to call it, or the inverse of the so-called price level. It's easier to think in terms of price levels. It's one over the, the price level of everything else. Because we've already defined the purchasing power of the gold ounce, say, as being the inverse of the price level of everything else in terms of gold ounces. This is then the analog. The price of money is the, is the same thing as the inverse, or one over the price of all other goods and services. Why, why is the demand curve for cash balances falling in this situation? Well, you keep a certain amount of money, just simply the amount of money you keep in your wallet as you emerge on your day's activities. You want to keep a certain amount of money in your wallet for various reasons. First place, you don't really know how much you're going to need for spending. It's emergency money, you might get hit by a truck, you might, it might be raining, you might want to buy an umbrella or something. In other words, you want to keep a certain inventory for emergencies or for uncertainty or whatever. If the price level is higher, supposedly the prices double tomorrow. Prices of everything double. Angel Gabriel has descended and double the old prices. You don't need Angel Gabriel anymore for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Your lunches will cost twice as much, and the emergency if you get hit by a truck, all these things will cost about twice as much. Therefore, you would need, you'd like to have, if you have it, twice as much money in your wallet, twice as much inventory. In other words, if the price of money is quite low, if in other words, a dollar doesn't buy much, your demand for your cash balance is, is fairly high. You like to have twice as much or three times as much. Just the work, so to speak, the work that your cash balance does for you has to be, can only be performed if you increase the amount of money you keep in your wallet. Because otherwise, meeting uncertainty or guaranteeing against the whatever, buying stuff, knowing you have money to buy a lunch, all these things require a higher cash balance if prices are higher. Conversely, if prices were low, if the Angel Gabriel finally did something good once for a change and cut all prices in half by magic, then you can do the same amount of work that your cash balance does for you now can be accomplished with half the amount of money in your wallet as you had before. So in other words, if the price of money were higher, or prices in general were lower, i.e., then you would need much less in your cash balance. If you link these two or more points together, and what you get is a falling demand curve for cash balances. In other words, there's an inverse relationship between the quantity demanded to keeping your cash balance and price of money. Okay, now we have the demand for money which is falling, we have a vertical supply line of money, and I will now contend that the price of money is determined by the intersection point at any time, the day-to-day -day equilibrium will be the intersection point 
of the demand for money, the demand for cash balances, and the supply of cash balances. That the intersection will determine what the price of money tends to be at any given moment, what the price level, in other words, tends to be. See, the analogy is perfect between this and the price and, and demand and supply and price for individual products. Supposing we're up here, supposing the price of money is higher than the equilibrium. It's up here, in other words, the price level is lower. At this low price level, we have a situation where the existing supply of money, which remains the same, where you can't change the supply of money, that's, that's given at any time. It's there, it's the amount of gold that are hanging around. At that low price level, people don't want the money in their cash balance. Prices are low, and let's say there's $2 billion worth of gold around. People only need $1.8 billion in their cash balances. The rest of it, spend the other $200 million. As they spend the other $200 million, the demand curve goes up, price goes up. The price level is so low that the gold and silver that you've got, let's say the gold you've got, is burning a hole in your pocket. You're going to spend it. The point is, you see, you're trying to get rid of your of money, in a sense. You're trying to get rid of your cash balance. In the aggregate, you can't get rid of cash balances. You're stuck like a hump, so to speak, hump in your back. The society as a whole is stuck with the existing cash balances. The total supply of money remains fixed, unless you take the gold and throw it in the river, which I don't think anybody's going to do. So what happens is, as you're desperately trying to get rid of your cash balances, in the aggregate, you can't do it. But what happens is, since prices rise, prices of goods and services rise as you spend money faster, you get more down your cash balances, the demand curve goes up. As this happens, as the price level increases, the gap disappears. Gold no longer burns a hole in their pocket because prices are now high enough so it doesn't. It just meets their the aggregate desire to hold cash balances. Conversely, looking at it the other way, if the price level, price of money is too low, if, in other words, the price level is higher than equilibrium, then you have this kind of situation. You still have the $2 billion worth of gold, but now prices are so darn high that you want more cash balance than you've got. Rather than burning a hole in your pocket, you haven't got enough money. This is a shortage of cash balances. If everybody feels a shortage of money, not in the sense of, of course, everybody wants more income, but in the sense of you want more cash balances than you have available uh, because prices are so high, People try to get desperately get more cash balances. How do they do it? The amount of the cash balance is fixed in the aggregate. Since the amount of gold can't be increased magically or anything. You're given the same amount of gold. What you're trying to do that is you, you spend less money on goods and services. You hold on to more of your income and keep it in your cash balance in order to increase your cash balances. As people restrict their spending, prices fall. And as prices fall, the shortage of cash balances no longer appears. By this action, the public is able to lower prices until they don't want any more cash balance. So in other words, if the price of money is higher than equilibrium, if in other words, the price level is lower than equilibrium level, the gold will be burning a hole in people's pockets and they'll spend it. And as they spend it, they're trying to get rid of cash balance. They can't get rid of it in the aggregate. What happens is that this action raises prices until they're satisfied with what they've got. Similarly, or conversely, if the price level is higher than equilibrium, they hold on to more of their money to try to increase their cash balances. And the result is this, prices will fall until they're satisfied with what they've got. There's a, a tradition in economics theory to, to sneer and deprecate people who want to increase their cash balances, so-called hoarders. Hoarding is when somebody else than yourself wants to increase the supply of cash. It's supposed to be a terrible, evil thing and causes depressions and all sorts of other nonsense. Actually, all it's doing is if people are hold, holding on to more of their cash balances, the demand for money increases, then, since the supply of money is remaining the same, you can't do anything about that, then what's simply going to happen is that the price level will fall until people are happier. In other words, in real terms, in quotes, correcting for price changes, you're increasing the real cash balance. And certainly it seems to me that if it's legitimate to want more hula hoops or less hula hoops or want more eggs or, or less eggs or whatever, if it's legitimate to save more and invest more or save less and invest less, it's certainly just as legitimate to want to increase your cash balance proportions and to have that satisfied by, the, by prices falling. People, for one, one reason or another, want more cash balance than they've got. This will be satisfied by this. Cash balance will go up and uh, prices will fall. Price of money will go up. This will satisfy their desire for increased cash balances. Now, this, the price level then is determined at any given time by the, the vertical supply line and the falling demand curve. What then changes it? Well, two things can change. Price levels, of course, change all the time, or the price of money changes all the time. What then changes it? Two factors and two only, either because the supply of money changes or because the demand for money changes. 
talking just before, just now, about the demand for money going up. People want more cash balance for whatever reason. Either they, they might be more miserly than before or whatever. If the demand for money goes up, then the demand curve will shift to the right. It means that the old intersection point, with, of course, a fixed vertical supply line, means that the old intersection point, now, see, before they were satisfied, before it was a market-clearing purchasing power level. But now, because people want more cash balances for, one, for whatever reason, so their margin utility of money is going up. So now, in this new situation, because of these new value scales on the part of the people, now we have uh, a shortage of cash balances suddenly emerged. So that now we are not satisfied. People want more cash balances. People then spend less money, restrict their purchases. As they do that, the price of everything falls. And as the price falls, we reach to the new equilibrium point, the new market clearing point, which is now higher because the demand curve for money has gone up. And at a new higher equilibrium point, it means that the price of money is now higher, prices in general are lower, and people now have achieved their desire to have higher proportion of cash balances by the fact that prices have fallen because of their action. Conversely, if people's demand for cash balances falls for whatever reason, the demand curve of cash for cash balances falls, and then the exact opposite happens. This means that the old equilibrium point, we now have all of a sudden the goal is burning a hole in their pocket, Start getting, try to get rid of it. We wind up again at the, a new equilibrium point where there's no longer money burning hole in anybody's pocket. The proportion of cash balances to everything else has fallen. So now we have a situation where we have the same aggregate supply of money, but it's doing less money work, you know, less cash balance work, because prices in general have gone up, and so people have achieved their goal of arriving at a lower proportion of cash balances. See you how know, changes in demand for money. If the demand for money goes up, then prices in general will fall. In other words, the price of money will increase, so the price, the price level will fall. And conversely, if the demand for money goes down, people want less than their cash balances, this will lead to the price level uh, going up. Now, usually, the demand for money, this is really, of course, an empirical statement. We're now reach, going down to the apodictic absolute truth to a more sort of a relative empirical kind of statement, usually people's demand for money doesn't change very much. It's influenced by several, a lot of institutional factors. For example, it's influenced by the frequency at which people get paid. Uh, just something, a simple thing like that can very strongly affect the desire, how much you, you want to hold your cash balances. Those you know, two people have the same income. Say they have an income of $12,000 a year. A and B both have an income of 12000 but well, the difference is that A is paid once a month, so A gets a check of 1000 the first of each month, say, and B, however, gets paid twice a year. I used to be in that position way back. I was in a position of getting paid twice a year. I was working for a foundation, a foundation grant. And believe you me, it was pretty rough, because even though my total pay, the total annual pay was comparable with other people's, but if you're not a precise allocator <laughs> of your expenditures, you spend the, the last month of every half sort of in perpetual hawk, <laughs> tidying checks and whatever until, like, until the bonanza comes in on, on July the 1st. So supposing this Mr. D gets paid twice a year. So he gets 6000 uh, January 1st and another 6000 July 1st. Okay, their total income is the same. If you simply look at the income over the years, $12,000. However, let's look at their different average cash balance. Let's assume that neither of these two guys save any. Let's assume also that each one spends at a smoothly uniform rate, you know, a certain amount, proportional, fractional amount per day, which of course is unrealistic, and it gives the, it gives the idea here. A starts off the first of the month with $1,000. By the end of the month, he's got zero, just ready to expire before he gets his new $1,000 check. His cash balance on January the 1st will be 1000 bucks. His cash balance at the last day of the month will be zero. So therefore, his average cash balance for the month will be $500. And the same way with the rest of the month, each month, to look down over the yearly period, he's also got a $500 cash balance. So the average cash balance of Mr. B gets paid once a month is $500. This is the average amount that he keeps in his wallet or whatever. On the other hand, look at poor B here. He's got, he starts off with $6,000 in his bank account. He winds up with zero. And so for each half year, he's got an average cash balance of 3000 bucks. So he's got an average cash balance for the year of 3000 bucks. Poor B is really in bad shape because he has to keep, he has to keep an average cash balance of six times the amount of Mr. A. <laughs> 
So what happens, for example, if frequency at which people are paid institutionally shifts, which is what happens sometimes. It usually remains the same for a long time and something happens. Uh, if people, for example, shift from wage payment to salary payment, I think wage workers tend to get paid once a week, and salary workers say get paid once a month. In that situation, supposing they shift, everybody shifts from blue collar, or their status suddenly shifts, and they say everybody's dubbed the white collar worker. Say, you're really a big shot now, Jim. You're really a white collar type. And to honor the change in status, instead of paying you once a week, we'll now pay you once a month. Uh, in that situation, he's, his demand for cash balances goes way up. He's got to keep a lot more. And so if there's a general shift from weekly payment to monthly payment, the demand curve for cash balances will go up. I guess it would be a good way of looking at inflation in a way. Price level will then tend to fall. Pay people uh, less often. <laughs> in other words, you pay people the same amount, but if you pay them less often, everybody has to keep a higher cash balance. So there are things of that sort. There are institutional matters of that sort. Plus there are value scales. But it turns out that, again, empirically, one of the big reasons for shifts in demand for money is what's going to happen to the price level of money.